Absolutely, absolutely. Short form content is like that. And it's really sometimes more challenging to create really great short form stuff because it's pushing you and distilling your message down to the most succinct, you know, form. And that's why like when companies do branding, they have like two to three words about what the company's about, like Nike, just do it, right? And welcome to a new episode of Digital Coffee Marketing Brew. And I'm your host, Brett Deister. And subscribe to this podcast if you could. It really does help with the rankings and let us know how I am doing. But this week, I have Mark with me and he is a guy that knows his video. And this is where we're talking about this week is all about the video content and his own production company. He does everything from high end brand branded video content. He's been doing it for quite a while. He's self-taught as well, but it's good to have him on the show. So welcome to the show, Mark. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. And the first question I ask all my guests is, are you a coffee or tea drinker? Oh, definitely coffee landslide. Mm, is it like, do you like, like the light, dark, or medium roast? Do you have like specifics that you like? I'm kind of a light roast and I'm very particular about my coffee. I have like a, a kind of super automatic espresso maker. And then I take like a milk frother and I have to use the coffee make creamer in the milk frother. And then I combine those two together and it's just magic in the morning. Oh man, you're like, you're almost like borderline barista, which I used to be in another <laughs> life, but I used to be actually be a barista. So you do like the whole, like steam your milk, put it in, but you also have like a certain thing that some baristas don't like when it's very specific. Cause it's like, Oh man, we got to do this. We got to do it right. Cause if we don't do it right, you're going to come back and I'm going to have to remake it again. Yeah. I, I have two kids, so I have to be very quick with it. It's just like a one button press pour in the thing froth and mix them together and I'm good to go. But it is perfect, quick and uh, delicious. I will tell you that. Fair enough. But I gave a brief some of your expertise. We can give our listeners a little bit more about what you do. Yeah, absolutely. So um, I own a video production company in Austin, Texas called Mosaic Media Films. I've been in the industry for about 12 years, not only creating content myself as an independent freelancer many moons ago, but I also trained aspiring filmmakers on how to create stylized business videos that convert. And now I have a team of creatives where we'll work with businesses and brands on creating content to connect with their audience and leverage that content on marketing so they can uh, build relationships, increase trust, and ultimately increase conversion. So what are the latest trends? Obviously, one's going to be AI because AI has been kind of the whole, like everybody talks about it. Even I've talked about it to you ad nauseum. I really say ad nauseum because it is getting a little old to talk about it, but what are the latest trends we're seeing coming in from creating branded video content for brands? Yeah, absolutely. So when it comes to branded content, the stuff that we do is predominantly narrative talent, storytelling, and there's nothing that's going to be more powerful than that. There's great AI stuff there. We're not going to waste a lot of time with that. It just makes the job sometimes a little bit quicker but really authentic, genuine narrative storytelling, whether it's a company talking about their business, how they're solving people's problems and what it, you know, what their life will look like when they connect with them, either on a product or service, or just genuine case study stories that will do, where instead of it just being a testimonial, like, hey, they were great, they were wonderful, it's a transformational story of how they went from having a problem the company solve that and what their life looks like. Because at the end of the day, you know, we want to have that genuine human to human connection. And that's what video can do, you know, more powerfully than a lot of other mediums out there. So, I mean, how can, let's say a brand is new at doing this or they're starting to get into it. So how can they effectively or a realistic way start to tell a story through video? Because video, everybody knows it's not as easy as, well, doing audio. Even audio is not that easy because if you have terrible audio, no one wants to listen to you. Yeah, absolutely. So like uh, the audience will be very unforgiving if you have bad audio. So audio is like number one key. They're, if you're posting it for social media, they'll be a little bit more forgiving with video. However, things like your cell phone today are pretty darn good. They're really impressive with the quality of video can get, but little things like audio make a huge, huge difference. So one tip that I'll give, you know, 
uh, businesses or brands that want to create content and maybe don't have a budget to hire a company like the, us that's like total turnkey and they want to do some stuff on their own, the best place to start is just very simple video testimonial or case story type of videos. And this can be as something as simple as a customer doing a video themselves, kind of sharing their story, and then you just kind of, you know, putting and uploading that really raw. So again, you wanna make sure that the audio is really good. And from a story structure, the best advice I can give you is you wanna just tell uh, and frame the question or the story from, the, from an objection turned success. So people wanna see transformation and they wanna be validated in how they're feeling. So if you ask the customer, what was your hesitancy? What was resisting you from purchasing from us? If they say something like, you know, I was resistant to buy, I don't, wasn't really sure because I've been burned so many times before because it was so much money, but then I took the risk, I took the challenge, I, you know, and I went forward with it and it's been incredible. And then you kind of go into the accolades and success of what their life is like. That one potentially 30 second video can provide enough validation and authenticity for someone to put them over the edge because video, whether it comes in the form of a promo video or it comes in the form of a case study story, or whatever the situation is, you're trying to increase that speed of trust. And I always say, great way to start is testimonial content. And it's great for you to say things about your business, but it's even better for your customers to say stuff about your business. Mm. So, I mean, for starting the whole process, would it be like doing a storyboard and figuring out like, is it an explainer video? Is it a testimonial? Like figuring out that structure first before you launch into recording it. Cause I'm pretty sure a lot of people are like, well, let's just record it and see what happens. But a lot of times that kind of makes it go, how am I supposed to edit this? Yeah, absolutely. Without getting too in the technical side of things, really the first place you should start is what are your intended goals, right? So what are you doing for marketing now? and what's working, what's not working, how do you reach out to your audience? And then that will tell you what type of content that you want or should be thinking about doing. So the strategy that you'd have on it, like let's say you run ads through pay-per-click is gonna be different than the type of campaign that you're gonna have on social media, which is gonna be different than the type of campaign that you'd have for cold email outreach. So that right there is gonna start to be like, what videos do we need to be thinking about? And then you can kind of do the story. So let me give you a, a little bit of an example to provide a little more context to this, right? So we'll compare social media to pay-per-click, right? So on social media, let's say Facebook, for instance, what you're trying to do is you're trying to stop the scroll, right? So people are looking at their friends and their family and they don't really wanna look at ads. So the type of content that you wanna do there that performs typically better, not all the time, is what's called native content. And that's basically like a selfie video because people don't realize that it's an ad. They think it's just one of their friends or their friends that's showing a product or they're talking about a service, right? So native content will perform better on social media. And then when they click on that ad, that's when you wanna send them to a higher quality branded video because now they've kind of entered your brand and they know that, okay, this is a service, I've kind of got my interest. Now contrast that with like a Google pay-per-click, right? So the person isn't being interrupted. They're actively either researching or they have a high commercial intent. They're looking for a product, they're looking for a service and they want to you know, do their research and they're in that mindset of I'm ready to buy. They have knowledge that they have a problem. So there, when you send them to whatever page it is, whether it's a specific product, whether it's a specific service, or just your brand in general, that's where you wanna have that higher quality production because they're comparing you to other companies. And most other companies are not gonna have video. And um, when you can do video in a compelling way that tells a story that they're trying to do, because they're telling themselves a story when they're typing in that keyword, like, I have this problem, I want someone to solve it, and this is what I want my life to look like. These, who I'm looking for is gonna get, who's gonna, um, who I can trust, and who's gonna help, who I have the most confidence that's gonna be able to change my life story for me. So that's kind of the first thing you need to be thinking about when it comes to video, is how are you gonna use it, what are your goals, and what are you doing for marketing now? And I mean, could you also put it in the bucket of like, what's gonna be your long form content, what's gonna be your short, like, 
this is happening yeah. now type of content because you could have two different ones and still create a good strategy around that. Absolutely, 100%. So a lot of it is going to be dictated on where are you posting from and what type of content are you doing? So I, I usually have this you know, phrase where I say, the smaller the screen, the smaller the intention span, <laughs> right? So big screen, you know, at the movie theater, people will sit for two hours, television, hour and a half show, half hour show, you know, when you get to your cell phone, and depending on what they're looking at, if it's, you know, uh, Facebook or Instagram, you know, 15, 20 seconds, right? So that's typically, you know, the way that you want to approach it. So uh, on a social media platform, where you have that short form content, that's where you want to provide like short educational pieces. If you're like a service company, a product company, you know, you're doing like comparisons, you're doing how it works. Short form content performs better when people are on social media, longer form on like, you know, they're entering your brand, you know, on their computer, actively searching for stuff, or YouTube can be both short and long term. So a lot of it, you know, again, depends on what your marketing strategy, are you a B2B, B2C, selling products, selling services, and that will kind of give you um, some best, best practices based on that. So I mean, yeah. for your phone, it's almost like the billboard, like style, because billboards, you can only put 10 words. Yeah. And that's it because yeah. people can only read 10 words while they're driving by now in LA traffic, you could probably write a paragraph because people are sitting in traffic all the time. But usually it's about 10 words. So it's like that similar vein for like, the short form content, like, we should really be thinking about the billboard style for your phone almost. Absolutely, absolutely. Short form content is like that. And it's really sometimes more challenging to create really great short form stuff because it's pushing you and distilling your message down to the most succinct, you know, form. And that's why like when companies do branding, they have like two to three words about what the company's about, like Nike, just do it, right? So it's really consolidating that that short form video down to like the most consolidated uh, fashion. So like if you're a product company, it's just trying different angles and what connects with your audience, right? So it's a comparison, it's a use, it's an instructional, you know, it's all these different angles that you can take um, to see what's connecting with your audience in a short thing. So just think about one thing to do and try to distill that down. You know, I meet with uh, the team from Meta almost weekly, bi-weekly now, and they've they've said 15 second vertical videos is what's performing the best on the platform overall. So not only length and duration, but think about format as well. So a lot of times, you know, us as a video production company, we're shooting things kind of widescreen, but we always have to frame it a little bit further back because we wanna know, you know, if we were to, do this vertically, how is that going to translate? And is that going to get the message across? So that's why those kind of selfie videos that are vertical perform really well, or just vertical videos shooting a little bit further when you need to show more in your scene for the shot that you have. So just consider that with short form content. Yeah, I mean, you could, I mean, Panasonic has their open gate. So it basically makes the square of the full frame. So I can, I don't have to blow it up as much because the 16 by nine format for those that don't know there's different ways of shooting from the dslr type cameras i have a panasonic s5 mark ii x and they have an open gate feature which basically makes it the so a full frame camera has the is a bigger sensor than a micro four thirds which panasonic made famous with olympus as well but the full frame gives me the full length or the full width and height of the frame as opposed to the 16 by nine that will cut it down. So that should be considered we're shooting as well. If you're using like a DSLR like mine, maybe people should shoot an open gate so they get the full width of the of the, the sensor so you don't have to blow it up as much as you're saying, right? Yeah, absolutely. And you know, what works really well is you wanna be able to shoot in 4K. So if you have to crop, you can kind of zoom in and position accordingly if you need to convert it to vertical. So shooting in 4K is good. And then depending on the type of camera, whether it's a full frame, micro four thirds, or, you know, a 35, you know, super sensor you can do, basically it's just consider shooting a little bit wider if you know that you're going to end up converting it to a vertical video. Uh, and that's the best approach. And depending on what type of lens you're using, 
will determine, you know, you want to zoom out or you just need to physically move your body. How much space do you have in, you know, where you're filming and all that kind of technical stuff. But that's basically um, the approach that you want to do whenever you're creating content. Think about how can I repurpose this or leverage this one video on multiple platforms in the format that's going to be native to that platform or perform a little bit better. Mm, yeah, because I mean, the one I said, the open gate is actually 6k for mine. So oh, I'm nice. good on that. I'm good on yeah. the blowing up. It won't like degrade it as much. For those that don't know, there's different types of quality for cameras. There's 1080p, 4k is what you're seeing on most televisions nowadays, even though TV hasn't migrated yet over to 4k. Then there's gonna then there's, well, there's 2k there's 4k there's 5k 6k i mean it goes up and up and up i mean i've seen 8k tvs now from ces so you're gonna see more more different types of k that's not money it's not how much the tv is it's just the resolution of it for those that don't really understand all the different monkeyers that they're using for all the all this stuff so i mean for youtube the, the ceo have said that they want to push more into their YouTube TV. That means using YouTube videos. So should they be thinking about 4k now because they really want all their stuff to be, or they want more of the videos to be in 4k. So they'll use that in YouTube TV. Should, should brands and all the things should be thinking about upscaling or trying to make their resolution to the 4k format instead of 1080p because 1080p is easy to easy to, to encode from your computer, but 4k takes, takes a little while sometimes. Yeah, absolutely. I think you always should be filming in 4k, you know, we'll sometimes film in 4k, but we'll work in a 1080p sequence and just downscale it. Uh, so the, the compression is, is we can compress it more and that creates a smaller file size. So the playback quality will be better once you upload it. However, if you're specifically working with YouTube, um, you can do a 4K and a 4K sequence. You need a really powerful computer to do that. And then whenever you upload to um, YouTube, they're going to compress it even further than whatever compression you do in like a median encoder or any other uh, tool that you're using to get it out of the editing software to an actual file. Um, so those are just some couple things to keep in mind um, when you're working with you know, YouTube, uh, and always be shooting in like 16 by nine, um, with, you know, kind of standard format for that. Got, got you. So what tools should they be using? Maybe, like I said, they can't afford the one-stop shops, which are great because you don't have to worry about anything, but what tools would you recommend for them? Let's say like editing a video because half the process is you shoot it and now you have to edit this thing. Yeah. So, I mean, we use professional cameras and professional software. That's kind of total turnkey. But if you're like a do it yourselfer, you know, I, the best thing and the easiest thing to start with is seriously just your cell phone. You know, once you jump up from your cell phone to a DSLR, it's a pretty big jump because with your cell phone, it's just click and go. And it takes a lot of the automatic stuff and it does it all for you. Once, once you start to jump to like a DSLR or a mirrorless, um, you know, you get into all these like ISO and you have to do like, what is my white balance and all these other things that like requires a, you know, a higher level of training to be able to get that, um, uh, you know, get, get that level of quality and get that level of knowledge. So as far as camera, that's really what to do on the audio side, there's great kind of out of the box audios that you can audio tools that you can use for your cell phone but the closer to the source of sound you can get the better. So wireless labs that have a little um, you know, piece that attaches to your cell phone, like a receiver, and then you have the actual mic that attaches here, that's gonna be significantly better than having something that's on the camera unless you're really close. So the closer to the sound you are, the better. That's why having like a lab or a clip on is better than a, you know, the camera's four feet away and it's got a little microphone at the top. Um, so that's really, you know, what you can use for that. As far as editing software, there's a lot of great, you know, editing software out there. One, um, one that I would recommend if you're on a Mac is actually a tool called ScreenFlow. It's a very interesting because it originally started as a screen capture, um, 
uh, you know, editing tool where you just would record your screen and then you could apply all these stuffs, but it's become now a full on video editor. And for people that aren't familiar with how to edit and, you know, all the different technicalities of, you know, transitions and, you know, different layers and different tracks and sound design and all other stuff that's very complex when you work in a, you know, very professional software like DaVinci or Premiere, ScreenFlow is like a great place to start um, if you have a Mac. So those three things are really powerful. If you're just starting out, use your cell phone, you know, great audio tools that you can get on Amazon for probably under $50 to $100. And then using a tool like ScreenFlow for your basic editing, we're just dragging and dropping it in there. You're trimming things and then you're kind of off to the races. You can even add some graphics and things in there as well. So basic things like that, if you're starting, are great tools. Mm. What about like CapCut? Because CapCut is another one that I've seen yeah. on YouTube yeah. quite a bit. That one is <laughs> created by Bit by Dance, who owns TikTok, yeah. who's been in the news for quite a while, not for good reasons. Yes. Yeah, that's an excellent recommendation. Ironically, you know, I kind of uh, laugh because that's what my son uses. You know, he's 15 and he loves to edit stuff, you know, car videos on CapCut. And he's always telling me about it. And it's great because it has both, you know, a desktop and a mobile app. And it's a lot of, it's the same kind of essence of screen flow where it's a, a very easy, very user-friendly. And, you know, it's got a lot of drag and drop things that you can do to make a pretty quick edit. If you're not super experienced in, you know, uh, video editing, you can kind of just pick it up and go. Yeah, I mean, the other one I would say is DaVinci just because it does have a free, actual free version that you can use. Now, there are some things you can't use with it. So I have DaVinci Studio version. Nice, yeah. So I I know it. I used Premiere before, but I hate that I had to transition to two different programs just to like work on things. And DaVinci uh -huh. was just a better workflow for me because it had Fairlight, it had Fusion all baked into it. Plus the coloring is probably second to none on yeah it because it came from that will, that's what it will, originally was it was a coloring software for a mm -hmm. professional that black magic bought davinci and then turned it into a full-fledged thing they also have yeah. an ipad app as well which helps with that it's okay i it's not my favorite one to use but it's actually it's not bad for what for what you so i mean for brands i i and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I would recommend either the one you said or CapCut or DaVinci Resolve free version if you want to figure out that high end type of a thing. Yeah, totally. I would I would certainly recommend that. So if, like for the do-it-yourselfers, you know, small businesses and brands where like hiring a full production turnkey company like us doesn't make sense. Those are some great out of the box tools. You know, what we really do is specialize on like understanding your marketing and like, what are your goals with your marketing? Like we were talking earlier and developing a story or videos that you can have for three to five years. So it's really, you know, uh, coming up with the narrative, doing the shots with the fancy cameras, editing everything, putting it together in a compelling way. I mean, we've had clients that have had their same video for 10 years. And if I showed you the video, you'd be like, there's no way you created this 10 years ago, you know? Um, but when you're just starting out, those are some excellent tools um, to leverage, like you said, cap cut, you know, your phone, micro, you know, microphone off of Amazon, and just getting that momentum going with video. And then when you're in, you know, a bigger brand, bigger business, you have staff team, you know, things like that, then it makes sense to kind of engage with a, a full production company to kind of level up your creative uh, content. Mm. And yeah. then what are some things that brands should know if let's say they have to shoot their own like i always mm -hmm. say there's some like important things like the gear is great but i would say lighting background lighting and foreground lighting and making your room wherever you're shooting sound treated is probably the two biggest things you should worry about more than the gear yeah absolutely so i'll give you a couple tips with lighting and a couple tips here with with audio stuff so when it comes to lighting, uh, one of the things you have to understand, one of the things that most amateurs do is they will just, they'll turn the lights on in the room and they'll just have all the natural light in the room as well. So rule number one is just turn off the overhead lights because they're cheap and you're gonna get a mixture of lighting. So like you could have tungsten lights in the room and then natural daylight. So they have different temperatures and usually everything looks really, really muddy. 
Um, so number one, turn off all the lights in the room. If you can use natural light and that works well. So like me right now, I'm just using natural light. I don't have any studio lights. Um, because I have like wall to wall windows here. So that can look really well. And um, depending on the type of mood that you want to create. So I have a really like bright look, because the brighter the look you have, it's like, you know, from a psychology standpoint, it's supposed to be more trustworthy. It's bright, it's happy. So that's why you want to create that emotion through lighting. Now, if you want a more shaped or dramatic look, that's where you want to obviously turn off all the lights in the room and then block out all of the lights in the room. So you really want to create like almost a black box. So if you have curtains or blackouts, put those on. Um, sometimes when we're in spaces, we'll use, um, they're called blackout ready shades. So they're like little, basically huge, huge post-it notes that are like the size of windows. And we'll do that so we can create that black box. Then what you want to do is position one light basically at a 45 degree angle. And when you do that, you'll create a shadow in this side of the face. Now, the closer the light is to the front, the brighter it's gonna be, the less the shadow is gonna be more pronounced. So if you move the light this way, you're gonna get a more pronounced shadow. And if you go really here, it's gonna be super dramatic, okay? So it all depends on how dramatic you want. That's why mo most of the time we'll put it here. And then what you wanna do is you wanna put the light diagonal of the backlight or hair light diagonal. So you have this big light here, that's creating a little bit of shadow and shape right here. And then you have a light here, kind of just lighting this area. So you wanna create light, dark, and then light again. Um, and that's something you wanna do. Now, another thing when it comes to lighting to keep in mind is the bigger the source, the softer the light. So what most people will do is they'll get really cheap kind of square lights like this big and they'll try to light their whole face in a dark room uh, and it usually doesn't look good. So the bigger the light is, so when we do you know, shoots with clients, we have this huge massive dome that's like a you know two to three foot by three foot. It's really, really big because in relation to the body, that's a big source of light and it's softer. And to create that softness, you wanna create distance between the actual light and you wanna put some kind of filter and that is, what's called diffusion, and that will soften the light. Um, you know, some people kind of the do-it-yourselfers, you could use like, you know, like a transparent, um, like shower curtain. That's what some people will do. And that acts as diffusion. So you have the light, and then you have the diffusion that softens the light, spreads the light, because now it's creating a larger source. Um, and that will create a softer light. So those couple things on lighting will help tremendously. Um, on the audio side, uh, one of the things you wanna be mindful of is when you have really tall ceilings, like sometimes we'll do interviews and we'll have really, really tall ceilings. And we what happens is the sound will carry and it'll come back. So in order to dampen that, there's a couple of things you can do. One, put like some type of rug or mat on your feet. So it kind of dampens that sound and then do the same thing at the top. So obviously you can't put a rug above you, but what we'll do is we'll create like, you know, like a, we use what's called a flag and without getting too technical, it's basically this, you know, metal piece where it has, you know, uh, like some fabric on it. And what that's doing is it's stopping the sound. So what happens is you're kind of making the ceiling shorter by doing that. So um, by having that rug and having that flag above your head outside of the frame, it can create a better, warmer sound and you have less echo. Yeah. I mean, I usually recommend for yeah. like hard surfaces, which is, basically like wood floors and everything, put a rug down. It will help because carpet always yeah. the best when you want to record because carpet will take a lot of that sound and basically help with the reverb from the high ceilings and then stuff in the, your space does help. If you have various different like, like mm -hmm. shelves and stuff will help make it bounce in weird ways. So it won't actually have that echo effect when it's a not as filled room that's when you start to get a lot more echoes in it as well is that yep. is, is that correct is that was um yeah 100 i mean basically just all the things that 
combined together to kind of dampen the sound. So the rug is designed to dampen the sound so it doesn't travel as far. The same thing with the flag above you, the same thing with all the furniture around you. It's just designed to dampen the sound so it doesn't bounce and travel all over the place and you create that echo, uh, you know, kind of sound that you'd get if you were in an empty room with tall ceilings. And then what are you seeing for the future trends of just video editing, video production, and just basically showing it with brands like where where to post it and everything yeah absolutely so as far as marketing goes the biggest thing that uh, brands need to really be thinking about is like trying to create um, a variety of different content what i ver see very often is they'll create like one video and that's it and they'll try to do too much so they'll create, uh, let's say a promo video, and they're like, we want this to appeal to customers, we want it to appeal to vendors, we want it to appeal to new people that wanna potentially work with us, and we want it to be like, also good for this industry, this industry, and this industry. And it's just like, you're saying too many things in one video. What you need to be thinking about is like thinking about separate videos for separate audiences, because each audience has a different problem and challenge that you're trying to help, um, so they want it to be their story, right? So we kind of talked a little bit about that earlier about, you know, people are Googling, they're thinking, I want to change my story, right? And usually a good example th that I try to tell people is what they're, what they're really doing is by trying to say everything to uh, too much is like you're trying to say, when you say too much at all, it's like you're talking to no one, right? When you try to talk to everyone, you talk to no one. It's kind of like going into Best Buy and saying, hey, um, can you show me your computers? I need a new laptop. And then basically going off on a tangent about the refrigerators, the televisions, and the cell phones. It's like that's what you do when you try to cram too much in a video is you're not talking to that particular person and their particular needs. So that's, that's what brands really need to be thinking about is that. And then also need to be thinking about multiple videos over across a funnel. Um, so like if you're a service-based business and the main way you get leads is through them contacting you or scheduling a call or making an appointment for a consult. So you need to be thinking about like, what's the promo video or content or service video that's specific to them and their problem. And then providing a video about, Hey, if you book a call, this is what you can expect. And then after that call, then creating another video saying, thanks for making the call. Here's kind of what you, here's what we're going to be doing. And by the way, between that time, here is what you can watch and some other things that will help you along the way. And then sending them an email that provides those resources to them. So by doing that, you're walking them through the step, guiding them as if you were with them face to face, but they're also getting to know you before they know you and you're increasing speed of trust. So by the time they get on the video with you, they've had like three or four touch points of you that person connecting with them so it's like they already are starting to build that trust and build that relationship before they've actually even physically talked to you and so i mean what you're saying is basically what a lot of new podcasters do in the beginning They're like i want my podcast to reach everybody and that's like no you really no you want it to be a very specific thing because you're not going to reach yeah. everybody and no one knows what your podcast is about then yeah, absolutely. It's really about, you know, when we work with our clients, we really try to understand who is your customer, what is the problem that they're having, and how do you uniquely solve that? So I often will tell my staff, you know, we're creating the video for the client, they're hiring us to do the job, but who we're really creating it for is the person watching it, you know? So we always kind of have this phrase that we say, we wanna fall in love with our customer's customer. And that really is just understanding their pain, understanding their problem, understanding how the customer, that the client we're working with is gonna help solve that for them and what their life is going to look like. So when you can do that, you're able to connect with people uh, on a deeper level, um, especially, like I said, if they're searching in research mode, it's like, you understand me. I feel like you get me and I feel like you're going to take me to where I really want to be. Gotcha. And so people are listening to this and they're like, well, where can I find you online to learn more about maybe to get, use your company for the media or maybe find out more about video? Yeah, absolutely. So we have um, a part on our site, just go to mosaicmediafilms.com 
forward slash resources. And it's a great place to start. So there's quizzes on there. So if you're like, hey, I don't know where to start with video and you're, you don't know, um, there's a short 30 second quiz that you can take and it'll spit out a video and a guide on some uh, good direction on what you should be thinking about depending on your type of business and your marketing. There's downloadable guides, there's helpful videos, it's all free, you don't have to put in your email, you can access it there. And then on our site, you can also schedule a one-on-one -on -one strategy session where I kind of walk you through, you know, one-on-one, -on -one, where are you at right now? What does your marketing look like? What videos would make the most sense? And then, you know, if we're a good fit for what you're looking to accomplish with your goals. Any final thoughts for listeners? Yeah, I mean, if you're thinking about video, I think, you know, one of the things you do, like we talked about earlier, just get started with it. You know, video is no longer something that you can passively do or just kind of push the side. You really have to start doing it. And by using, you know, your phone, a microphone and some, you know, easy uh, editing software, you can get started right away and uh, start creating video content to connect with your audience. Mm. Well, thank you, Mark, for joining Digital Coffee Marketing Brew and sharing your knowledge on video and video creation and all everything video. Awesome. Thanks for having me. And thank you, as always, please subscribe to Digital Coffee Marketing Brew and all your favorite podcasting apps. Even a five-star review. It really does help with the rankings and let us know how I am doing. But join us next week as we talk to another great thought leader in the PR industry and marketing industry. All right, guys, stay safe. Get to understanding your video content and video content needs. And see you next week. Later.